Mercedes EQC is a large luxury SUV that's fully electric, but it's very much a product typical of the three-pointed star. Direct rivals shade it in certain areas, but it's difficult to beat in terms of driving refinement and interior finish. And class competitive in terms of things like driving range, cabin practicality and charging time replenishment. It is, in almost every way, the Mercedes of EVs. Mercedes has taken its time in joining the full electric automotive market, but its entry into this segment has been planned with characteristic thoroughness. Here is the first of many battery-powered products which will follow from the company's freshly formed EQ brand. It's the car that will, in future, be remembered as the very first volume-produced electric Mercedes model. Welcome to the EQC. Firstly, a bit of background. Now, Mercedes has been dabbling with automotive electrification since the turn of the century, first with an e-cell version of the A-Class, uh, then with various battery-powered smart models, and more recently with an electric drive derivative of the last generation B-Class MPV, which featured a drivetrain part developed by Tesla. That American brand has blazed a trail in the full EV market over the past decade that the premium European makers have been forced to follow, but Mercedes has refused to be rushed, gradually establishing its own distinct three-part strategy for electrification. EQBoost, mild hybrid technology, is increasingly used as an integrated part of the company's combustion engines. EQ Power, plug-in hybrid models, are now available across the company his core product lines and no fewer than 10 new full electric EQ models will be launched by Mercedes over the next couple of years as a result of a 9.2 billion pound investment by the brand. Now these include full electric versions of the A class, the B class, the V class and the S class respectively named the EQA, the EQB, the EQV and the EQS. Uh, but it's this large luxury SUV, the EQC, that kicks things off. Unlike the other EQ models I just mentioned, it's a distinct standalone product rather than a derivative of an existing model. And as such, you would expect it to have a purpose-built lightweight chassis, the kind of thing that you would find on two of its key rivals, the Jaguar I-Pace and the Tesla Model X. Instead, like a couple of other direct competitors, the Audi e-tron and the BMW iX3, the EQC trundles around on the heavier underpinnings of a slightly smaller, more conventional combustion engined SUV, in this case the Mercedes GLC. Now partly that's because the Stuttgart maker wants to produce this EV model alongside the GLC at its German Bremen plant. Future unique EQ products we're promised will be uh, more bespoke and less compromised. But we're beginning with this one, which claims to be in every way a genuine Mercedes-Benz. In a market that you have to feel wasn't quite complete until it was entered into by the three-pointed star. So what does this car tell us about its maker? What does it tell us about the future of the EV market? And what chance does it have against talented rivals that variously claim to be better established, more dynamically adept, more luxurious or more affordable? It's going to be interesting to find out. Mercedes claims that with the EQC, the switch to full EV motoring can be completely seamless. And that's just how it feels once you get behind the wheel here. Press the start button, uh, select drive, and apart from the lack of engine rumble, it all feels pretty conventional. But as with all powerful EVs, the response you get when you brush your brogues against the throttle to pull away is anything but. Can this really be a two and a half ton SUV? Well, it certainly doesn't feel like it as 62 miles an hour flashes by in just 5.1 seconds and the EQC hurls itself at the horizon. Uh, this car's 80 kilowatt hour battery is of slightly lower capacity than the ones you'll find in its two biggest rivals, the Jaguar I-Pace and the Audi e-tron Quattro 55. But the powertrain here has been tweaked for greater torque. Uh, so this Mercedes feels every bit as eager as its opposition. There's 
there's 765 newton meters of it and that's about the same as you get in a Porsche Cayenne Turbo and the total output of 408 horsepower or 300 kilowatts. If that's not enough to impress your passengers then why don't you tell them that the electric motor revs to 12,500 rpm. That's not quite as high as Lewis Hamilton's Formula One car but it's not very far off. Once the childish pleasure of beating everyone else away from the lights and wafting around on all that torque uh, becomes a bit more commonplace, then you begin to adjust to the reality that, of course, this is a luxury EV, not any kind of performance car. Now, unlike Tesla, Mercedes really doesn't care to confuse those two things. And for the Stuttgart brand, well, luxury equals refinement. Now, you might think that quietness at a cruise would be uh, pretty easy to achieve in an electric vehicle but if you drive a few you'll start to notice the wind resistance the tire roar the suspension crash and the drivetrain whine which is normally masked by combustion power now for the EQC enormous efforts were made to try to silence these potential sources of noise so for example the wheel arches are layered sound absorbing material has been glued to almost every bit of internal metal panelling and the powertrains to asynchronous motors sit on rubber bushings uh, inside their subframes which are then linked to the body via flexible mounts. As a result this is not only the quietest EV on the market but it's possibly even the quietest car we've ever driven which is just as well because this Mercedes is heavily compromised when it comes to the other key dynamic contributor to the science of luxury ride quality. Now thanks to comparatively old tech underpinnings which were borrowed from a conventional Mercedes GLC crossover this EQC can't have the air suspension system which is an absolutely crucial inclusion on most of its rivals. It is fortunate then that the damping setup that is on offer uh, turns out to be as nicely balanced between comfort and agility as a conventional multi-link steel sprung arrangement tends to get, especially one tasked with keeping such a prodigious amount of weight in check. But of course it can't waft you over undulations, potholes and speed humps like an air suspended setup can. You can't even have adaptive damping, although on second thoughts perhaps that's just as well because this car already has quite enough driving modes to get your head around. There are five dynamic select driving modes and behind the steering wheel paddles allow you to access five further brake recuperation options. Uh, as in every EV, mastery of all these settings will be key if you're going to achieve the kind of operating range that's being promised. In this case a WLTP cycle figure of 259 miles that, as usual with a car of this kind, will be significantly affected not only by your driving style but also by temperature extremes, uh, by frequent gradients and even the extent to which the car is loaded up and with the number of passengers you have. Uh, Mercedes though has used thoughtful technology to try to make this black art just a little bit easier for early adopters. So how does that work? Well, you simply select max range from the dynamic select menu and you'll access an intelligent driving program that's designed to preserve battery charge. And if at the same time you use the steering wheel paddles to select the de-auto recuperation mode, proactive brake energy regeneration will be conducted for you uh, via special eco assist software. Uh, this not only minimizes electrical current expenditure from the powertrain, but it draws on GPS data to try to make your Use of it more efficient. So, for example, subtle buffers and accelerator pedal travel and foot off accelerator dash symbols will urge you to back off when, via nav data and traffic sign recognition, the Eco Assist system calculates that any more throttle use would merely go to waste. At the same time, a dash diagram will pop up to give you the reason for the intervention. Uh, for example, junction ahead or gradient ahead. It's all really clever and it must require gigabytes of processing data, but it's also quite likely that you might find all of this well-meaning assistance somewhat annoying if operating range isn't an overriding priority. 
In which case, once you get used to your EQC, you might like to experiment with various setting combinations for yourself. Uh, Dynamic Select also offers another efficiency oriented selection, Eco, as well as Comfort and Sport options too. And there's a Dynamic Select individual menu, which allows you to tailor your own preferred particular drivetrain, steering and ESP parameters, saving them as a one-touch choice. As for the recuperation system, well, if you don't want to leave it in default the auto then you can use the steering wheel paddle on the left to scroll through low medium or high energy harvesting settings uh, badged D D minus or D minus minus uh, the last of these will slow the car substantially when you come off the throttle although not quite as heavily as is the case with some rivals uh, which use recuperation systems that when they're set to their max can almost bring you to a standstill without touching the brake alternatively via the right hand paddle here there's a D plus setting which reduces recuperation uh, so that the car will coast normally off throttle in a more combustion engine like fashion. Now if you're glazing over a bit in trying to understand all the settings and systems that we've just touched on then we really wouldn't blame you but the truth is you don't necessarily need to know all of this if you don't want to interface with all the technology it'll all just whir away unobtrusively in the background as part of a driving experience that in most ways is really very little different from that of any conventional luxury model in keeping with its nominal positioning as an SUV the EQC has four wheel drive although that's rather nominal too it's delivered as a byproduct of having an electrical motor on each axle the front one is tuned for economy and drives the car on its own when range is a priority uh, the motor at the back meanwhile cuts in when power and speed are needed or of course uh, when there's a need for extra traction it does go without saying uh, that this isn't any kind of off-road conveyance but it will manage the odd light farm track it'll give you tarmac stability and a snowy snap and it'll ease you out of the odd muddy car park without too much drama uh, with the optional tow bar fitted it'll even lug along up to 1800 kilos what this Mercedes won't do though is deliver much to reward the kind of driver who likes a degree of dynamic handling prowess. Uh, the rival Jaguar I-Pace has set a standard in that regard that the EQC uh, can't really match partly because it's much heavier and partly you kind of sense because Mercedes didn't really prioritize this attribute as part of this product's development. Perhaps they were right, uh, most potential owners probably won't care very much about the fact that the steering although it is accurate and it is well weighted lacks much feel and about the fact that this car's substantial mass is very evident when rapid changes of direction are called for there is after all as we mentioned earlier very much provided in compensation when it comes to the rather polished way that the EQC cruises about in a very Mercedes like fashion should you need to push on, uh, then the torque vectored formatic system delivers the traction and stability that you'll need, and that's helped by the battery pack's careful placement uh, between the axles, which delivers the usual EV low center of gravity. Should autobahn motoring be on the agenda, though, uh, you will find yourself uh, rather frequently having to give up your place in the fast lane. That's thanks to a maximum speed which is limited to just 112 miles an hour. As with all large luxury SUVs, the highway is where this one is in its element, especially if it's been fitted with the optional Active Distance Assist Distronic feature, which draws from GPS live traffic data, uh, which enables it to recognize and respond to a tailback and slow moving traffic even before you reach it. You get this as part of the optional Driving Assistance Package, which amongst other things also includes Active Steering Assist. Now that uh, basically does most of the steering for you at a cruise plus there's also route based speed adjustment and that uh, once you've programmed in a navigation destination uh, it can automatically adapt your speed to the curves and the roundabouts and the junctions that you'll encounter throughout that journey it's all very reassuring and reassurance is after all what you're going to need if you're going to take the plunge into the EV market for the first time in such an expensive segment. Who better to provide it though than a manufacturer with a history as long as that of the motor car itself.
Would you know this to be a Mercedes? Well, possibly not. What the company calls an avant-garde and distinct look simply appears somewhat generic from a distance. But up close, a more brand-specific design charisma does shine through. Now, size-wise, the EQC sits between the Mercedes brand's mid-sized GLC and large GLE SUV models. It shares most with the GLC, although it's 100 millimeters longer. But like its main European rivals, it can only take two rows of seats. There was never any question here of seating for seven. The sporty, stretched silhouette doesn't allow for it, and it confirms the EQC's positioning as an SUV very much from the fashion-led crossover class. Hence, the low waistline, the high-gloss aluminium framing for the glass house, and the huge bicolor light alloy wheel rims, which vary in size between 19 and 21 inches, depending on your choice of trim. Uh, we've got the 21-inch AMG multi-spoke rims here. Roof rails have been deliberately omitted to preserve the wind cheating shape, although attachment points in the roof structure still allow carrier systems to be mounted, and the charging flap that's integrated flush with the right rear side. Let's take a look at the front. Uh, it's intended to epitomise a so-called progressive luxury theme that's supposed to define the EQ sub-brand. Well, perhaps Gordon Wagner's design team thinks it does, but actually the only thing that's really striking about this nose section is this large expanse of black panel surfacing that wraps around the lower part of the grille panel and flows up into these standard multi-beam LED headlamps. Now that grille panel has seven silver louvre strips on the base sport variant, but the AMG line derivatives, which most customers will buy, surround this central star with twin louvres instead. A neat detail touch is this optical fibre lighting strip that flows across the nose just under the leading edge of the bonnet uh, and connects the torchlight daytime running lights in an almost uninterrupted horizontal light band. There is also blue headlamp detailing, uh, which discreetly confirms this model's membership of the EQ family. And AMG line models also get the more aggressive jet wing style lower bumper and front apron styling, which is in evidence here. Now that features simulated side air inlets in the high gloss black. At the rear, well, this uh, deep roof spoiler emphasizes the width of the rear window, as do these slim multi-section LED tail lamps that stretch right across the tailgate and in both design and in edge light technology echo the light band at the front. Uh, the chrome embellished rear bumper incorporates the registration plate in the manner of Mercedes Coupe, uh, so as to make the three-pointed star just above particularly prominent. As usual, of course, what's more significant is the stuff you can't see. Now, some of it is very sophisticated, principally the 384-cell 80-kilowatt-hour lithium-ion Deutsche Accumotive battery, which weighs a substantial 652 kilos and sits in the floor between the axles. And some of it isn't, primarily a steel structure and suspension setup uh, lifted directly from the GLC Mercedes SUV model so that this car can be produced alongside that one at the brand's German Bremen plant. A bespoke chassis would have reduced this product's weight by a substantial 150 kilos, which is why the forthcoming large EQ SUVs that Mercedes plans to build at its US plant in Tuscaloosa will all feature purpose-built platforms. So, futuristic exterior design and engineering concepts lie in the future. What you won't have to wait for, though, as an early adopting Mercedes EV brand buyer, is a futuristically high-tech cabin. That is delivered right here, right now, courtesy of the twin widescreen digital displays which characterise all the company's current cars. Here, appropriately enough, uh, the effect is subtly different than it would be in, say, a GLC or a GLE. Lined silver trimming, which is supposed to be reminiscent of the cooling ribs found on high-quality music amplifiers, flows from the doors and around the back of the two seamlessly joined 10.25-inch screens. And there's more... Uh, blue detailing strips feature on either side of these monitors, 
while rose gold highlights subtly emphasise the stylized air vents, the door cards and the fascia. RT slotted Burmester speaker grills on the A-pillars add a touch of class on the plusher models and trendy eco-minded materials introduce a cool current feel to the cabin design. Can this dash covering really have been fashioned from recycled wetsuits? Well, Mercedes doesn't claim that, but you could almost believe it. As you'd expect, the driving position is a little lower than it would be in a more capable large SUV, but it still manages to strike a good balance between elevation and accessibility. Uh, the dial pack that you view through the stitched three-spoke leather steering wheel offers two gauges, a speedometer on the left with charge status and range, and a dial on the right that can be tailored to display either a power meter, a navigation map, or a trip computer readout. Uh, now, if you have previously owned a modern Mercedes, you'll be familiar with the functionality which allows you to change the instrument cluster graphics. Uh, there are the usual three layout options. There's white themed classic, yellow tinged sport and progressive, which in this case gains rose gold colouring. Uh, you can configure your display options via a tiny touchpad on the right hand steering wheel spoke. Subtle differences also characterise a central infotainment screen, which, as usual in a Merc, can be accessed manually either via another tiny touchpad on the left-hand steering wheel spoke or by a swipe-and-push lower touchpad down here between the seats. Uh, most of the time, though, you'll find yourself simply using the intuitive Hey Mercedes voice control functionality. Uh, now, this is one of our favourite things about this car. Conventional voice control systems require certain specific voice commands from their users, but this setup's linguatronic natural speech recognition is really pretty good at understanding, well, pretty much anything you ask of it. Not only things like navigation, audio and informational functions, but also ventilation settings and ambient lighting control. It's also quite good at predicting your wishes. So if, for example, uh, you regularly phone your mother on your journey home from work on Tuesday afternoons, then the screen will flag up her number as a suggestion on this particular day of the week. Or if, for instance, you regularly switch over to a radio station with news at a certain time, then you'll eventually find that the MBUX system prompts you to do that. Plus, of course, the Hey Mercedes software is completely EQ savvy, so you can quiz it on battery status or you can ask it where the nearest charging station is. This central screen is essentially the same as that which features on other modern Mercedes models. It's divided into phone, nav, radio, media, comfort and info segments, plus one for the various apps that you'll be able to access, including those for hotel bookings, news and weather. Uh, there are some really sophisticated graphics in play here, uh, especially when it comes to the real-time displays that you'll find in the extra EQ section added for this all-electric model. Now, this is all also accessible uh, via a direct selection key in the lower control panel. Click on this EQ tile and you'll be able to monitor things like charging current, departure times and energy flow, plus you can pull up a consumption histogram too. We don't, of course, mean this to be a complete eulogy to Mercedes cabin design. Uh, there are certain commands that still catch the MBUX system out, and it's totally unacceptable in a car of this price to have to pay extra for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Plus, some of the fixtures and fittings really aren't as classy to the touch as they look to the eye, particularly these rather plasticky air vents. Now, while we're griping, let's also tell you that the wide centre console eats into the front footwells and that the raked rear window and the swept back side glass don't help your over-the-shoulder visibility. Fortunately, a rear view camera and all-round parking sensors are standardised right across the range. There are no problems with frontward visibility though, which is much better than it is in, say, a Jaguar I-Pace, thanks to narrower A-pillars. What else should we tell you? Uh, well, the seats are supportive, and across the range, as you'd expect, they feature lumbar support to minimise curvature on the spine on longer trips. Uh, as for cabin storage, well, there's pretty much everything that you would want. Uh, the smart, glossy cover of this stowage area at the bottom of the centre stack eases back to reveal twin cup holders, a USB C port, and an optional wireless charging mat. Further back between the seats here, this twin lidded bin 
incorporates a further couple of USB-C ports uh, together with the uh, converter leads that you'll need for them. Uh, there are bottle holders in the deep door bins and you get what would usually be a spacious glove box uh, complete with a pen clip. Although here that has been compromised in size by the need to incorporate the uh, fragrance dispenser for the optional energizing package. You also get a storage net in the front passenger footwell, uh, ticket clips here on the sun visors and an overhead sunglasses compartment. And there are lovely detail touches too. For example, the standard pre-entry climate control system should mean that you'll never have to scrape the windows and get into an ice cold car in winter or enter a sweltering cabin in the height of summer. A sophisticated system with a heat pump and electric heater boosters pre-climatizes the interior based around the start time that you program into your cabin screen, into your home PC or into the provided Mercedes Me app or it's simply kicks in for five minutes once you unlock the car. Uh, thoughtful options also improve your user experience. Uh, this head-up display, for example, this has a screen size that's big enough to show far more than these kinds of setups usually do. Uh, and it includes navigation instructions, uh, which can be optionally embellished with what Mercedes is calling augmented reality technology. This is effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead, overlaid with house numbers, road names, uh, direction arrows, and other useful bits of information that'll help you to find your way. Another optional feature that we really like is the energizing package, which combines music, lighting and scent into six selectable programs, uh, refresh, warmth, vitality, joy, well-being and power nap, all aimed at rejuvenating you at the end of a tiresome day. And there's also a training option which is aimed at relieving muscle strain on longer trips. And there's an intelligent energizing coach feature which recommends individual programs based on the kind of journey that you're on. It can even communicate with a smartwatch or with a fitness tracker should you be wearing one and then it'll automatically select a perfectly suited energizing theme that you can start directly just when you need it. Right, time to take a seat in the rear. Now, due to its relatively compact GLC-derived underpinnings, an EQC is fractionally shorter than the I-PACE, uh, a Tesla Model X or an Audi e-tron. Will that put this car at a disadvantage to those key rivals when it comes to rear seat space? Well, let's see. Well, legroom is merely adequate for this class of car. Uh, there's certainly not quite as much room to stretch out as you'd find in those rival models we just mentioned, but there's not a huge amount in it. And the EQC is more spacious for three across this rear bench than is the case with that rival Jaguar. Uh, there would be even more room in this regard if this car wasn't compromised by having to have this central transmission tunnel, even though there's uh, no central transmission to house within it. Uh, that is, of course, uh, another disadvantage of saddling an electric vehicle with underpinnings which were originally developed for a combustion engine car. As for headroom, well, that is slightly compromised by the swept back silhouette and by the floor that's raised to accommodate the battery pack beneath it. Still, we think that only very lofty folk required to spend very long trips back here will be minded to complain very much. And even they have the option of improving things by reclining the seat backs. As in all EVs, the seat bases don't slide though. Uh, the usual practical provision is in evidence. Uh, things like overhead reading lights next to the coat hooks and just below Below these two silver circular centre vents, there's a pull-out compartment uh, with twin USB-C ports and a 12-volt socket. As for storage, well, there are reasonably sized door pockets with bottle holders, there are seat back pockets, and there's a centre armrest here uh, with a storage compartment and twin uh, cup holders that pop out. As we said earlier, there's no third seating row option for EQC buyers. Uh, the only EV in this class that offers that is the Tesla Model X, which might not be too much of an issue if Mercedes were to provide a decently sized boot. So let's finish by taking a look at cargo space. 
press the Mercedes three-pointed star and the tailgate glides up to reveal a 500 litre trunk. Predictably that is a fraction less than you get in the Audi, Jaguar and Tesla models we've been mentioning but the Mercedes boot is practically shaped. It has a wide aperture and it features a low loading lip. Uh, there are deep recesses either side of the entrance. Uh, the left hand one being netted. Uh, there's a 12 volt socket on the left hand cargo sidewall. There are bag hooks on both sides and there are four silver tie down points, one in each corner of the floor. Unusually for an EV, you get a bit of underfloor storage space too, and the flap to access it is lockable. Uh, lift it and you'll find that there's not enough space to house a spare wheel down here, but you could uh, store quite a bit away from prying eyes. Uh, the usual Mercedes fold-out shopping crate resides down here. Uh, it's an appendage that uh, looks rather flimsy, but actually turns out to be surprisingly useful. There is also a little compartment by which battery attachment points can be accessed. The adjustable seat backs we mentioned earlier can be set in a slightly more upright position if it helps to get bulky suitcases in. And the rear bench's 40-20-40 split means that the centre part of the backrest can be retracted for longer items like skis. Uh, neat catches are provided on the cargo bay sidewalls for when you want to completely flatten the rear bench. Uh, which then folds uh, almost flush to the floor to free up 1,060 litres of capacity. This 408 horsepower EQC 400 variant was the only version of this model available at this car's introduction, but you can also ask your dealer about the more affordable, lower powered derivative that the brand promised would appear once this EV had got itself established in the market. As for this EQC 400, well, that sells in the 62 to 72,000 pound bracket, and those figures assume the deduction of the government's 3,500 pound plug in car grant. That entry-level price applies to the base EQC Sport variant, but most customers will want to move at least one rung up the trim ladder and find £2,000 more for AMG line specs. So think in terms of a budget of around £65,000 for that. If you can find another £5,000 and stretch up towards the £70,000 mark, then your dealer will point you towards the AMG line premium variant. Or if you can find around £7,000 over AMG line trim and stretch to nearly £72,000, then you'll get yourself this top AMG line premium plus derivative. We'll get into where that kind of pricing fits within the luxury EV market in a minute. To start with though, let's give you a Mercedes range perspective by pricing uh, this EQC against other conventionally engined Merc SUV models that you'll find on the other side of your local three-pointed star showroom. Price-wise, the EQC range begins where mainstream versions of the brand's slightly larger but more conventional GLE SUV finish. And an EQC is priced around 15 to 20,000 pounds above the only slightly smaller GLC model it's based on. Now, if you're afflicted by the spectre of range anxiety in buying this full EV, but you still want a large Mercedes crossover with some degree of electrification, then your salesperson might well point out that for a little less than a base EQC, you could have have the plug-in hybrid diesel version of the brand's GLE, the 350DE. If you want a plug-in Mercedes petrol-powered SUV, then there's a version of the GLC that provides just that, the GLC 300E. Uh, both these models are possible options for a potential EQC buyer, but the whole reason many will be considering this full electric EV in the first place is because they want to be free of fuel stations forever. Which is all well and good, but will a battery-powered car like this actually fit into your life? Well, if you're someone who would normally have bought a more conventional GLC or GLE SUV from Mercedes, you might well be questioning that. Anticipating this, the brand has developed what it calls its EQ Ready app, which is there to help motorists to decide whether it makes sense for them to switch to either an electric car or to a hybrid. This app can record and analyze regular journeys and your everyday mobility behavior in your current car and then compare it with the numerous parameters of electric and hybrid vehicles, making it possible to try out electric mobility in a virtual yet quite realistic way. If that app decides that some sort of electrification would make sense in your next vehicle, then of course it will point you towards the right Mercedes brand model for you to consider. 
But of course, if you are a potential buyer in the rapidly expanding luxury BEV, battery electric vehicle market, you won't want to limit your selections to those that Mercedes can provide. Now, you would be forgiven for not knowing your options from other manufacturers in this segment, since so many of the cars in question are either recently announced or just about to be launched. Now, the key differentiating factor between the various contenders is driving range, which we're going to quote to the current WLTP or World Harmonized Light Vehicle Test Procedure System Standard. Now, if the EV range figures that you come across vary significantly from the ones that we're just about to give you, it could be because they've been sourced using the old and far less accurate NEDC. That's the new European driving cycle standard. So ask if you're not certain so as to ensure that apples are always being compared to apples. As you might expect, Mercedes' key European premium brand rivals all offer similarly priced luxury SUV oriented EV products that directly compete with this one. And all of them have slightly different ideas as to the level of battery capacity, which is necessary with a large premium crossover of this kind. Now, for reference, this EQC has an 80 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, that's a little more than BMW's iX3 with 70 kilowatt hours, but a little less than Jaguar was I-Pace with 90 kilowatt hours and Audi's e-tron Quattro 55 with 95 kilowatt hours. Uh, from this little group, the Jaguar comes out on top in terms of the all-important WLTP rated operating range. It offers 292 miles between charges and that's helped by the fact that it's uh, around 400 kilos lighter than an EQC. Uh, this Mercedes comes in next at 259 miles followed by the iX3 on uh, 249 miles and the e-tron Quattro 55, which is hobbled by its prodigious weight on 241 miles. But what of Tesla? Well, Mercedes, like uh, Jaguar, Audi and BMW, tends to loftily try to ignore the American company's products when it comes to talking about direct rivals. But you shouldn't. In fact, we'd suggest that if you want a luxury BEV, the US brand has three cars that you might find difficult to ignore in this segment. Now, only one of them is an SUV and therefore directly comparable to an EQC. Uh, launched here in 2016, the Tesla Model X was the very first large all-electric SUV and it remains a key competitor for this Mercedes even though it's a slightly larger more expensive car with prices that for the volume long-range Model X variant start at about £83,000 around £20,000 more than you'd have to pay for a base EQC. Uh, that extra cash does get you more operating range a Model X long range can go up to 315 WLTP rated miles between charges and the Tesla is the only SUV in this class that can be had with seven seats. But the hard truth is that its interior quality is significantly below what most Mercedes buyers in this segment would want. Now we mentioned three competing Tesla options, assuming that you're not especially hung up on the idea of having an SUV, and we think many potential luxury segment BEV buyers won't be. Uh, then you'll want to consider the Tesla Model S, which, although it's a five-door, competes primarily in the luxury saloon segment. Now at the time of this test, around £78,000 was required to get you a long-range Model S variant with a substantially better operating range than this Mercedes has. Uh, it's WLTP rated at 375 miles. The handling of a Model S, though, simply isn't in the same league as that of an EQC. Closer in terms of drive dynamics is the American brand's Model 3, and that's a saloon, and although it's much smaller inside than this Mercedes, it is significantly cheaper with prices for the base standard range plus version, which has a 258 mile range, starting from under £40,000. A more direct EQC competitor is the Model 3 long range all-wheel drive variant, though, which at the time of this test cost just under £50,000 and offered a 300 148 mile driving range. So that's it for your all-electric options. Obviously, there are plug-in hybrid models in the luxury large SUV segment. Uh, EQC Muddy Wood, for example, get you very well-specified plug-in petrol-electric versions of the BMW X5, the Audi Q7, and the Porsche Cayenne. But that's not quite the same thing. As we said earlier, the whole reason many customers will be considering this Mercedes will be because they want to get away from fossil fuel. 
Now, if that is the case for you, and having considered all the competing BEV segment options that we've just talked you through, you then decide that it is an EQC that you really want, then you're going to need to know, obviously, just how generous Mercedes has been with the standard spec. So let's go on to have a look at that now. This EQC model's GLC derived underpinnings disadvantage it when it comes to weight and another drawback of using an older platform which was originally developed for a slightly smaller, less expensive car is that it can't be configured to work with the kind of air suspension system that you can have on those uh, rival Jaguar, Tesla and Audi models in the segment. Otherwise though, the, the spec of this Mercedes is very class competitive. Uh, the base sport variant that comes comes with 19 inch alloy wheels, multi-beam LED headlights and privacy tinting at the rear for windows that uh, all around the car feature heat and noise insulating glass. Plus, you also get front and rear parking sensors and also keyless go comfort keyless entry. And that includes uh, a powered easy pack tailgate that can be activated with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. Uh, inside, the upholstery on the base model is trimmed with man-made Artico stitched leather offered either in black or in a beige black combination. The front seats are heated with lumbar support and a real interior highlight is the 64 color ambient lighting system. Now that bathes the cabin with soft, soothing shades at night. Uh, now you also get thermotronic climate control. You get a multifunction leather stitched sports steering wheel. You get cruise control with a speed limiter and also a reversing camera. Uh, there's also the usual Mercedes Dynamic Select driving mode system with max range, eco, comfort and sport settings. Plus there are five brake energy recuperation options all accessed by steering wheel paddles. Uh, decor touches include aluminium inlays and a dash top which is stitched with Artico man-made leather and which features rose gold piping. The real cabin talking point though is the MBUX, Mercedes-Benz user experience multimedia infotainment system, which is controlled by two 10.25 inch screens, one for the instrument cluster and another in the center of the dash. The MBUX system doesn't give you smartphone mirroring as standard, but it does include hard disk navigation, uh, 225 watt DAB Mercedes sound system, Bluetooth and a live traffic information feature which is free for the first three years of ownership. Plus there's also the brand's Hey Mercedes voice activation system and you're going to quickly find yourself using that to operate many of the interior features. Uh, the MBUX package also incorporates another feature that we really like, uh, what Mercedes calls car to x communication. Now uh, this is a mobile phone supported exchange of information system which will see your EQC sending data on driving conditions back to a central hub which then shares it with other Mercedes drivers. Now that will mean that in a way that's almost magical your EQC will know in advance about things like icy conditions and traffic jams. It's really clever. Uh, talking of information technology, uh, like most premium brands, Mercedes has developed systems that allow you to monitor many aspects of your vehicle from your smartphone. Uh, every EQC model comes as standard with the Mercedes Me Connect vehicle monitoring package. Now that works via a free app. This can allow you to set charging times and to activate timings for the car's pre-entry climate control system. Plus, as with all larger Mercedes models, it reminds you when a service is due and it can automatically detect and share with you details on your car's wear and tear items. In addition, the app includes a parked vehicle locator. It gives you a one-touch button for fast accident and breakdown recovery and it automatically alerts the rescue services in the event of an accident. It can even track your EQC if it's stolen. It can tell you if it's left a pre-agreed geographical boundary if you lend it out. And it can tell you where the vehicle is if you've gone and forgotten where you parked it. 
As usual with an EV, there's single speed automatic transmission, in this case matched with 4MATIC four wheel drive, and you get a couple of charging cables, a mode 2 lead for plugging into a conventional socket, and a mode 3 cable for use with wall boxes or AC public charging points. Unfortunately though, there's only one charging flap. On a rival Audi e-tron, there are charging ports on both sides of the front of the car, so you're not constantly trying to stretch the lead that you need to a single point. Uh, as mentioned earlier, almost all EQC bars will be ignoring base sport spec though and deciding instead on one of the three AMG line trimmed variants, all recognisable by this twin bladed front grille panel design and AMG specific front and rear aprons. With a straightforward AMG line model you get 20 inch wheels and side running boards while inside there's real leather upholstery, sport seats, carbon fibre trim, AMG floor mats and sports pedals. If you can stretch to AMG line premium spec, then you'll get 21 inch wheels, an electric sliding sunroof, and a parking package with active parking assist, which will automatically steer you into spaces, aided by a 360 degree camera system. Inside, AMG line premium trim entitles you to a nine channel, 590 watt, 13 speaker Burmester surround sound system, uh, a wireless charging mat, and smartphone integration, which gives you Apple CarPlay, and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Plus there's a navigation system embellished with what Mercedes calls augmented reality navigation. And that's essentially a live camera feed of the road ahead overlaid with house numbers, road names, uh, direction arrows and other useful bits of information. The Premium Plus Equipment Line Pack also includes the brand's energising package which combines music, lighting and scent into various selectable programmes aimed at rejuvenating you at the end of a tiresome day. Uh, to this tally, the top AMG Line Premium Plus variant that we're testing here adds a head-up display and memory settings for the seats. Uh, as for optional equipment, well, unusually for a Mercedes, there's not much. Uh, the main additional thing that you'll have to budget for if you haven't owned an EV before is the needed home charge wall box, which costs around £900, including VAT and installation through the brand's preferred supplier, BP Charge Master. Uh, you will almost certainly need to budget extra for your choice of paintwork too. The only standard colour is solid polar white. Otherwise, you'll be finding £685 extra for one of the various metallic shades. Uh, we've got brilliant blue metallic here. If you're happy to spend even more on a really exclusive paint finish, then the brand offers three special Designo colours, diamond white or hyacinth red for £895, or if you really want to push the boat out, then selenite grey mango costs £1,795 more. A tow bar isn't always optional on an EV, but it is available here. Enough with that, let's switch to safety, always a primary consideration for Mercedes. Now with the EQC, as well as introducing the choicest elements of its camera-driven safety and autonomous driving technology, the brand has also tried to redefine the passive safety standards that can be expected from a luxury car in the EV segment. Now here, a specially developed subframe surrounds the drive components up front, while the battery gets its own protection shield and is surrounded by a particularly robust frame with an integral crash structure. Uh, after an impact, the front side windows will be lowered, the central locking deactivated, the steering column raised, and the interior lighting will be illuminated to help rescuers enter and passengers escape. The high voltage system can be shut down automatically in a crash, and it can be deactivated manually by emergency teams via designated shutdown points. Each Mercedes model these days has what is called a rescue data sheet. Now that uh, tells emergency workers how best to cut you out of the passenger cell at a crash site. Uh, stickers on the charging flat and on the B pillar have QR codes which can be scanned for direct emergency access to those sheets. 
In short, then, what we have here is a fundamentally safe car, even before the brand's camera and radar-driven technology is added into it. So let's give you some highlights from that roster for this EQC. We'll start with active braking assist, which warns the driver of an impending collision and which will brake this Mercedes automatically if there's no response. Now, testing has indicated that this setup will eradicate 20% of nose-to-tail accidents and it will decrease their severity in a further 25% of cases. Active lane departure warning, that is also standard and that's there to warn you if you drift out of your lane before applying subtle steering assistance to ease your EQC back to where it ought to be. And there's also blind spot assist, which is there to warn you if you're just about to pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. In addition, all variants get attention assist, which will monitor your driving reactions for drowsiness, and the pre-safe anticipatory safety program, which will tighten the seat belts, close the windows, and even adjust the seats in a fraction of a second if the stability system deems an accident is inevitable. Uh, there is also an active bonnet to protect pedestrians, and the usual twin front side and curtain airbags, plus there's a knee bag for the driver. Uh, as you'd expect, tyre pressure monitoring and all the usual electronic aids for traction, braking and stability control are included too. And traffic sign assist, speed sign recognition is built into the widescreen cockpit displays too. Adaptive brake lights flash in emergency stops to warn following motorists and an emergency call system alerts the rescue services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off in an accident. If you want extra safety stuff, you'll have to pay Mercedes around £1,700 more for the optional driving assistance package, which also includes some of the brand's semi-autonomous driving technology. Uh, to experience this, you'll need to be on a dual carriageway and you will have to have activated two of the driving assistance package elements, Active Distance Assist Distronic and Active Steering Assist. Now, the Distronic feature, that's basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control, which automatically regulates your distance to the car in front and can, if necessary, remotely slow the car with up to 50% of stopping power. Uh, active steering assist, that keeps you in the centre of your designated lane and it will, if needed, apply subtle steering correction to ease you back to where you ought to be. Uh, if you're trying the autonomous driving capability, you'll also want to experience another neat feature that's part of this optional pack, the clever Active Lane Change Assist system. On a dual carriageway with the Active Distance Assist Distronic Cruise Control and Active Steering Assist operating, the car will overtake by itself. Yes, really, just hold the indicator stalk for a couple of seconds and it will pull out to pass a slower vehicle and then slot itself back into lane as soon as it's safe to do that. That. The Active Distance Assist Distronic package also includes what Mercedes calls route-based speed adaptation. Now that uses navigation data to automatically adapt your speed before curves, roundabouts, junctions and toll roads. Plus it incorporates the useful end of tailback function too. Now this can also recognise tailbacks before you're aware of them, uh, reducing your speed before you even know you need to brake. Once in the tailback, then the EQC will position itself off centre in its lane to leave access space for the emergency services and as you creep along, uh, stops of up to 30 seconds are possible within which the car will automatically move off and follow the traffic ahead. Once the tailback dissolves, the EQC will accelerate back up to the speed that you previously preset into the Active Distance Assist Distronic Cruise Control. There's more in the driving assistance package too. Evasive steering assist scans the road ahead for pedestrians and it supports you in making sudden steering manoeuvres to avoid them. Uh, a pedestrian warning function specifically alerts you to people who might be just about to step out in front of you on pedestrian crossings and pedestrians there also targeted by an upgraded active braking assist system which is additionally embellished to incorporate cornering and cross-traffic 
traffic functions. Uh, a pre-safe plus feature that helps specifically with vehicles running into the back of you. If necessary, it locks the brakes on standstill to prevent your car from being pushed further into danger. And there's active blind spot assist, which not only warns you if you're just about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle, but it applies light steering torque to correct the maneuver. Uh, there is also the reassurance of active emergency stop assist, which cuts in automatically should you be suddenly taken ill at the wheel, for example, with a heart attack or with a seizure. In such a nightmare scenario, this feature will allow the car to seamlessly take over, initiating emergency braking and activating the hazard flashes. One of the biggest aggravations in running a full electric car can often lie not in range anxiety, but in dealing with the public charging infrastructure that you'll have to master in order to be able to properly operate the EV model that you've chosen. A myriad of energy companies now proliferate across the UK and Europe, uh, which means that even once you've found a charging point, uh, you might not necessarily have an account which will enable you to use it. Importantly, Mercedes has sought to simplify this whole process for its EQ model customers. It equips them with a Mercedes Me charge account, which aims to offer access to around 80% of the energy providers operating in this market. That is extremely useful, although for the time being, we continue to think that Tesla's network of supercharging stations still provides a more convenient solution for EV users. This EQC can't charge itself as fast as a Tesla or as quickly as a directly competing Audi e-tron come to that. That's because it has an onboard charger rated at just 7.4 kilowatts. Uh, to give you some class perspective, the onboard charger in an Audi e-tron Quattro 55 is rated at 11 kilowatts, while that in a Tesla Model X is rated up at 22 kilowatts. As a result, this Mercedes, unlike those two rival models, can't be plugged into an ultra-rapid 150 kilowatt charger charging station, but there aren't many of those about anyway, and at the kind of rapid 110 kilowatt charging point that you're more likely to find, Mercedes does claim a respectable 10% to 80% recharge time of 40 minutes. Uh, that's the kind of charging station that you'll find in the Ionity network, which Mercedes has partnered with Shell, Ford, BMW and the VW Group to establish across Europe, a year's access to which is included in this car's purchase price. The 400 volt, 16 amp, 7 kilowatt wall box that you'll need to get fitted in your garage isn't standard, of course. Uh, once you've paid around £900 to Mercedes preferred supplier BP Charge Master to get that in place, and once you've established an overnight charging regime, you'll find that it'll replenish your EQC's battery from 10 to 100% in 11 hours and 25 minutes. If it's necessary to plug it into a conventional household AC 230 volt a 13 amp outlet, then recharging will take a yawning 40 hours. As usual with an EV, a CCS 2 connector cable and a Type 2 charging cable are standard. That overnight wall box charging figure is probably the most significant one. Uh, to give us some perspective, it's two hours shorter than you need for a Jaguar I-Pace, and it's three hours shorter than will be required for the Audi e-tron Quattro 55. Now that is because Mercedes has chosen to use a smaller battery for this car than you'll find on those two direct rivals. Uh, it's the 384 cell Deutsche Accumotive lithium iron unit rated at 80 kilowatt hours. Uh, that for the I-Pace is 90 kilowatt hours, while the one in the e-tron 55 is 95 kilowatt hours. You'd expect the inevitable drawback of that approach to be a reduction in operating range, and sure enough, this EQC's 259 mile WLTP rated figure lags behind that of the I-Pace, which is rated at 292 miles, and is even further behind the class leader in this regard, a uh, Tesla Model X long range, which is rated up at 315 miles. It is though at least better than the official WLTP reading delivered by Audi's e-tron Quattro 55, which is restricted to 241 miles, and that's thanks to that car's rather prodigious weight. The other key class contender, BMW's iX3, goes 249 miles, although that's because the battery is just 70 kilowatt hours in size. 
In future, Mercedes will produce EQ models offering greater range capability than this. Uh, this EQC is somewhat hobbled in that regard by its need to utilize a conventional and rather weighty steel chassis from the brand's GLC SUV, uh, without which its quoted 2,495 curb weight would apparently be reduced by around 150 kilos. As usual with electric cars, there's an app, a version of the Mercedes Me application, which allows you to set charging times using your smartphone. Uh, at the time of this test in autumn 2019, there were 19,000 charge points at over 6,500 locations across the UK and over 45,000 across Europe. Websites like um, ZapMap are good for helping you find the nearest one. Or you can use the MBUX Infotainment System's integrated route planner to organize your journey between charge stations. Bear in mind that the cost of charging publicly will be a little higher than you'll pay at home. Uh, for domestic reference, uh, if you choose off-peak terrace with your garage wall box, charging your EQC could cost you as little as 14 pence per kilowatt hour, which means that replenishing your battery could set you back as little as 5.4 pence per mile. With all we've said about potential charging difficulties, it's possible that we're painting an unnecessarily bleak picture. After all, it's obviously pretty unlikely that a typical EQC owner will be running this model as an only car, and we're perfectly aware that the average person's daily round-trip commute is about a tenth of the operating range of this Mercedes. Uh, that range will, as ever on an EV, be heavily influenced by things like extreme temperatures, uh, by gradients, and also by the amount of weight that's being carried around. But of course, the major contributory factor will be driving style, hence the way that this Mercedes defaults into its most efficient drive and brake recuperation modes whenever it can. We'll take another opportunity to brief you on how these work. Uh, there's a selectable Eco Dynamic Select driving mode, which optimizes the efficiency of the powertrain. But if you're starting to fret about your remaining battery range, uh, then you'll want to go further and you'll choose instead the more extreme max range setting, which is particularly effective when it's combined with this car's default the auto brake recuperation mode. Now with both of these modes working together, a more proactive energy optimization regime does come into play, and that's courtesy of this EQC's special Eco Assist software. This uses onboard cameras and GPS data to try to provide subtle guidance in making your use of power in this car more efficient, specifically haptic feedback from the accelerator and flashing dash symbols which urge you to back off when via nav data and traffic sign recognition. The Eco Assist system calculates that any more throttle use would merely go to waste. If you don't completely trust the auto electronics in play here, then you can also take over manual control of the brake recuperation process, uh, adding in extra energy regeneration by pulling on the left-hand steering wheel paddle and scrolling through its D, D- minus or D-, minus minus, low, medium or high harvesting options. Uh, when the whole setup is working to its max, it really does make a big difference, reclaiming spent energy as you cruise, slow or stop. Uh, when the regeneration system is fully active and you take your foot off the accelerator, the electric motors work in reverse and they become generators of electricity to recharge the battery. In fact, on a hilly road with regeneration set to the max, uh, it's possible to gain as much as 70% of the energy you used going uphill through regenerative braking on the way down. It's all rather clever. Once we'd mastered all of this, we found that a regular operating range of comfortably over 200 miles was free frequently possible between charges. Maybe a little bit less than that in really cold weather though. As usual with an EV, there are plenty of graphical dashboard displays to assist your efforts towards efficiency. Uh, the instrument cluster here has a range display as part of the left-hand speedometer and a selectable power meter in its right-hand dial space. Uh, there's also a specific EQ menu on the central infotainment screen with five main sections. Uh, charging options, that will allow you to search for charging stations and set departure times. Uh, then there's consumption. Now that that will graphically show you the current and historical state of electrical consumption and brake recuperation. 
energy flow, well, that provides an interactive real-time diagram showing what is currently being powered by what. Vehicle, that shows the proportion of braking and throttle that you're using, as well as things like uh, steering and gradient angles. And finally, there's an interactive owner's manual. That's so you can quickly brief yourself on any of the vehicle systems that you don't quite understand. What else might you need to know? Uh, well, maybe you'll be interested in the fact that as an EV vehicle owner, you'll be exempt from the London congestion charge. And for the second year of ownership, you won't uh, have to pay an annual VED tax discharge. Uh, for company car users, electric vehicles really do offer potentially huge tax savings because they incur benefit in kind taxation fixed at just 9%. As for ownership peace of mind, well, uh, you're limited to the usual unremarkable three years. 60,000 mile Mercedes warranty. Now you can extend this to five years at extra cost, uh, but you really shouldn't have to. Maintenance is obviously more straightforward than it would be for a combustion engine model. An electric vehicle does, after all, have 20% fewer moving parts. Uh, there's no fuel tank, there's no exhaust system, and obviously no internal combustion engine. Uh, you wouldn't think that, though, to look at the service intervals that are needed by this car. An annual checkup is required, and maintenance work will be needed every 15,625 miles. Uh, to give you some class perspective, a rival Jaguar I-Pace needs a garage visit every 21,000 miles. Uh, with an Audi e-tron, it's every 30,000 miles. Mercedes really does need to look at this. Fixed price servicing is available across the range and uh, most buyers opt for the Mercedes service care plan, which could cost you as little as about £22 a month based on a four-year deal. Uh, this covers the cost of all recommended service items, including brake fluid, air filters and screen wash. Uh, via a Mercedes Me Connect services package, this car can also offer remote self-diagnostic capability and that enables your EQC to monitor wear and tear items and alert your local dealer to let you know if something needs seeing to. You can also insure your car through Mercedes, although of course most company drivers will have that included in their lease cost. If you do pay the insurance on your car yourself, then you'll need to know about the ratings for this model. They're pitched like its rivals at a top of the shop group 50. As for residual values, well, the class standard amongst premium rivals in this segment tends to be in the 60 to 65% bracket after three years and 60,000 miles of use. And that's a showing the EQC should comfortably match. As a result, this Mercedes should be reasonably cost effective to lease for company or private drivers. And what about the green issues? Well, Mercedes has done its best here. Uh, the EQC isn't built in the kind of bespoke factory with 100% ecologically generated electricity that assembles the rival Audi e-tron, but its Bremen manufacturing plant aims to be carbon neutral by 2022. That won't nearly be enough to satisfy some in the green lobby who get very angry about the whole pure electric car zero emissions ethos. They reckon it ignores the wheel-to-well demands of supplying the electricity that powers cars of this kind. Uh, we'd respond by pointing out to these people that they usually completely overlook the fact that CO2 figures for conventional cars fail to take into account the logistical cost of getting the fuel to the pump. Still, if you are one of those Enviro conscious folk, we'll tell you using a well-to-wheel -well calculation based on typical use of the UK's energy grid, taking an average UK grid CO2 contribution of 367 grams per kilowatt, the burden of filling your batteries in this car will result in a theoretical 70.4 grams per kilometer of CO2 being released into the atmosphere. Uh, for reference, the uh, equivalent figure for the rival Audi e-tron Quattro 55 is 87.3 grams per kilometer. So this Mercedes model showing is certainly good, but it is still some way from being completely completely green which is also a comment you could apply to electric vehicle engineering as a whole. Lithium-ion batteries aren't recyclable in the way that the fuel cells used in hydrogen-powered vehicles are. Uh, currently, when EV vehicles are reaching the ends of their lives, uh, the batteries are being reused as electricity storage buffers. After that, though, they can't simply be scrapped because lithium-ion has um, explosive elements. So these batteries are simply being buried in landfills, and that isn't 
isn't really sustainable in the long term for humankind. But then, nor is the pollution caused by combustion power. If you see the EV solution as the lesser of two evils and your choice of a battery power model has to be from the luxury segment, then Mercedes hopes that you'll be interested in what's on offer here. It's fortunate for Mercedes that its premium brand rivals have been equally tardy about joining the EV revolution. Can they provide a better, large, electrically powered luxury SUV than this one? But after trying an EQC, you might decide not. It might not be the most boldly innovative choice, uh, like a Jaguar I-Pace or a Tesla Model X, but in some ways, it's a more appealing package. After all, you get a nicer cabin than the Jag, and it offers better build quality than the Tesla. And both of the other two key contenders in this segment, the BMW iX3 and the Audi e-tron, offer a shorter potential operating range. Uh, so the EQC looks like a very complete package. It doesn't have the handling prowess of an I-Pace or the street side wow factor of a Model X, but you might think this Merc to be an arguably more complete product than both those two rivals. And we prefer it over all its competitors when it comes to issues like refinement, media connectivity and drive technology. Other issues? Uh, well, the looks are a bit derivative and the decision to stick with an older tech, weightier chassis for this car is the major contributory factor to the way that it trails both the I-Pace and the Model X in terms of overall operating range. Might you forgive the EQC these failings and choose it as an alternative not only to its EV rivals but also to that combustion-engined large luxury SUV you'd probably otherwise have been considering? Well, we can see why you'd be tempted to. Here, the transition into EV motoring is as painless and pleasurable as you'd think it possible to be. All packaged up with the kind of elegance and progressive technology that Mercedes loyalists will find hard to resist. Saving the planet isn't really on the agenda here. Unlike fuel cell technology, the concept of electrification is fundamentally flawed in that regard. But an EQC can claim to halve the environmental impact a car of this kind would normally have, which is no mean feat. Rivals claim the same, of course, but this model has the added advantage of being a Mercedes first and foremost. And for a certain kind of buyer, that difference is likely to be decisive.